Thank you, Kevin. Welcome, and good morning. It's a beautiful day. God has blessed us with an amazing day, so it's easy to say thank you today, but he blesses us with an amazing day every day. And today, I especially feel thankful to be able to worship here in freedom with y'all. And you can look around at some of the uniforms and the flags as today we recognize those who have served. So we have that freedom. So let's worship. Please stand and join me in the call to worship. The Lord be with you. You have come to rest from your labor. We have come to rest and refuel. You have work to provide for you and your family. We want to serve our church and community. We desire to be of service to God and country. Please join me in the opening prayer. God of creation, you did not rest until creation was complete. You labor to separate the light from the dark, the water from the land, the sun from the moon. Then you created us to work the land. Give us strength to care for your creation, to work the land, to provide food for us, and for all who walk upon it. Amen. Please remain standing for the opening hymn, Trust and Obey. way back to the piano. There we go. Um, good morning, everybody. Good morning. And we're going to be inviting our veterans to come forward in a couple of moments after the song, so I just wanted to prepare you. And if you are a veteran and don't want to come forward, raise your hand so I can embarrass you individually. Oh, you can hear? Okay, there you go. Yeah, so trust and obey. Um, one verse that I'd like to read that's related to this uh, hymn is Jeremiah 17, 7. So, blessed is the man that trusts in the Lord and whose hope the Lord is. For he shall be as a tree planted by the waters and that spreads out her roots by the river and shall not see when heat comes, but her leaf shall be green and shall not be careful in the year of drought, neither shall cease from yielding fruit. So here's trust and obey.
seated. And um, as you are, uh, if you have served in a branch of the military, Army, Navy, Marines, Air Force, Coast Guard, Merchant Marine, if you've been an auxiliary uh, uh, officer or um, recruit, if you have served, um, if you have also served in some of the what I would call paramilitary groups, if you've been a scout leader, if you uh, girl or boy scouts, this is this is the the breadth of the people that have been in service to this country on all different levels. Also, uh, well, let's just start with that group. If you have been in any of those categories, would you please come and walk forward here so that we can honor you today? Come on up. If you've been a WAC or a WAVE or if you have served in any of those capacities, do we have any female officers or people that have served? All right. Well, then I'll say, brothers, there's so many of us. Uh, why don't you come? Oh, there you are. There you are. And what? what? Girl Scouts? Yeah. <laughs> I know we have other Girl Scout leaders here as well. Um, am I on? Is this is this my hand? Oh. Yeah. Am I? No. Well, let's just see here. All right. Never mind. Oh, there it is. No, there it is. No, there it is. I don't know where I'm at. Okay. Here I am. So we're just going to go down the line here, and uh, and just real quick, uh, when did you serve, and and how did you serve? I was in the U.S. Navy, you know, 61 to 65. All right, very good, very good, Steve. U.S. Army, 84 to 89. All right, very good. 73 to, <laughs> I don't know, 03, <laughs> and both as enlisted and chaplain. All in right, Army National, Guard. Army National Guard. All right, very good. 63 to 65 in the Air Force. Air Force, all right, yeah. 65 to 67, Army, Vietnam. All right. So in the 80s, for 10 years, as a council leader for many Girl Scout camps. All right, all right, wonderful, yes. U.S. Air Force, 56 to 60. All right, all right, all right, yeah, Jim. 67 to 70, Army. Okay, all right. Army, 83, 89. All right. 68 to 70, Army. All right. 67, 68, Navy, Eagle Scout. Mm-hmm, all right, all right. Uh, U.S. Navy, uh, 72 to 94. All right, all right. Brothers and sister, we, we honor your service, and we want to thank you. You're not done. Um, we got to serve again? Yes, you have to serve again. We're serving in God's army together. And, uh, and I, you know, we did invite people to wear their uniforms if they still fit. But, uh, but uh, uh, you know what? That's a new uniform right there, Stan. That's a new uniform. Let me pray for you and for all who are in harm's way around the world serving right now. So... Merciful God, we know that you have called us uh, a higher calling even than military service, but you saw that these men and women would, would make it through to be here serving in your church and in your community and in their families and in the lives of those that they have influence with in the community. We are ever grateful, Lord. Um, we're aware that uh, there are many today who are serving on the front lines across the globe, there are those who are waiting to be called to serve. We have those in training. Um, we have some attached to our church who are, you know, moving through uh, their own development and their own ranks and those who will serve in the future. We know, God, that you're not done with us and you're certainly, unfortunately, Lord, you've left war to be our, our burden. But you are there with us. We pray for those who are under siege today. We pray for those who um, are away from their families for the holidays, 
for all the ways in which our military continue to serve, even in times of peace, for all that they provide for those that are less fortunate or whose countries have been dismantled and we've been there for food and medicine and supplies and encouragement. We know, God, not to forget our veterans. And we just pray that you would instill in us that gratitude and to let us be thankful, especially for the country we are privileged to live in. We ask all of this in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and all of God's children said, Amen. 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 Thank you, gentlemen. And thank you, Carol. <laughs> only one of the branches of the military there, Kevin. Do you want to do, do the whole medley? No, actually, let's just sit for a moment and let's listen to all of the branches of the military. an answer for you. I was reading today's scripture and in it Paul says the one who is unwilling to work shall not eat. I see an awful lot of retired people in the congregation. <laughs> Since they are no longer working does that mean that they don't get to enjoy the treats outside at Coffee Fellowship? That is an interesting question. I think what Paul is saying is that these people were just sitting back and doing nothing while others were doing the work of God, which often involved feeding the poor and the hungry. Not only were they not helping their fellow poor and hungry, or their Jesus followers, but they were rushing to the front of the line to eat when the church shared a meal. But, hmm, maybe Pastor Christie can help us out here. Pastor Christie, what do you think? Do our retired folks get to eat the yummy treats during coffee fellowship? I'm thinking. Okay, hi. Um, I think so. Because it said those that are not willing to work. It doesn't talk about those that have put in their time of work, working hard. And I think even after they've retired, they're still working out there. What do you guys think? 
Yeah. So I think that at Fellowship Hour, you guys can eat and we can go out and have some fun with you and get to know about your histories and how you've worked. Oh, I want to say one more thing, though. We just honored our servicemen. And there are so many out there that put their lives on the line and they serve in so many ways. And so I want to thank you all just from me and for those that have gone before you. What a privilege it is to be sitting here amongst you all. Thanks, Pastor Christie. That makes a lot of sense. Don't you think so, my friend? Yeah, Pastor Christie is one smart cookie. She is working on her doctorate after all. Well, with an answer like that one, she deserves to go to the front of the line at Coffee Fellowship. So if you guys can see, there's another ministry message up here. And I just wanted to take a moment to tell you family ministry is alive and well. And there's lots of exciting things that are going on throughout the Conejo Connect, but not just there in each individual congregation. Some of the highlights that I wanted to lift up for you is that Conejo Connect itself on Wednesday nights is consistently between 35 and 40. We've had a few that are a little smaller, a few that are a little bigger. This coming week here in the congregation, we're doing a Friendsgiving. There's not gonna be a whole lot of lesson to do. I may throw some games at you. But really what I'd like is we have two, and I think I need to buy a third turkey that are defrosting in my refrigerator right now. So Conejo Connect is going to supply the turkey. But each of you have favorite dishes that make Thanksgiving or the holidays for you. So I ask you to come Bring your favorite dishes and join us for our Friendsgiving feast. Other things that are going on that are super excited is youth. Now, last month, when we did youth, we had seven, six people show up. But I'd gotten from other families who wanted to come. This week, we were at just under 10. So I think it was nine. That would be under 10. And... <laughs> Uh, it's that doctorate. <laughs> so with that, um, I've also heard from three or four more kids that are already excited about joining us. We are doing it once a month because I don't want to overschedule our kids, but we're talking about maybe going to every other week as we come into January, depending on how our kids' schedules are going. We have the bell choir that has been put out for... Um, all of our children. It's going to be a collaboration between the three congregations and they're hoping to get enough children that they can do something for the Christmas time. We've had mentions of angel dancers coming back. We have SSP coming next year. We have children's and youth and teenager, all of those camps. So there is a lot in the works and it's been so much fun these last five months to serve with each and every one of you. So thank you. Christy, oh, yes. yeah, uh, Sierra Service Project, is that SSP? Sorry, yes, yeah. SSP, and there may be somebody that can speak to it better than I, because I've not actually gone, yeah. but Sierra Service Project is a time where our kids go, they get to one of the three sites. This year there's going to be a Cal California, Oregon, Barna one, one in Sacramento, and one in Salie, Arizona. I started to say New Mexico. Um, and... Do we have time? Can Kelly tell a little bit about, come tell about your time? Because it really is a, and I know that um, Emma's gone and Ryan's gone. She's like, okay. Uh, so it is a service opportunity for youth, uh, incoming ninth graders through leaving, twelfth leaving 12th graders. You come to a site, you like, you, oh. <laughs> I put you collaborate with a bunch of other youth from other churches, and then together you split up into different groups and go help. Like, for me, I was helping. How? Oh my gosh, we were painting a house for someone who couldn't do it themselves, so we were like helping the inside. Like, I think we painted a bathroom and their living room. Other people were building fences for people who like weren't able to do it. It's just a really cool experience for everyone. So. I do want to say, I think her situation was a little different. Sorry, thank you, Kelly. 
But she actually got to know the homeowners, too. They hung out. They made them lunch every day. There was always fresh fruit there for them. So you're not only building a whole lot of relationships among the other people going and the leaders of each um, SSP Sierra Service Project site, but even with the families that you're serving. So thank you all, and I look forward to serving far into the future with you. Our scripture today is from 2 Thessalonians 3, verses 6 through 13. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, we command you, brothers and sisters, to keep away from every believer who is idle and disruptive and does not live according to the teaching you received from us. For you yourselves know how you ought to follow our example. We were not idle when we were with you, nor did we eat anyone's food without paying for it. On the contrary, we worked night and day, laboring and toiling so that we would not be a burden to, you, to any of you. We did this not because we do not have the right uh, to such help, but in order to offer ourselves as a model for you to imitate. For even when we were with you, we gave you this rule, the one who is unwilling to work sh uh, shall not eat. We hear that some among you are idle and disruptive. They are not busy, they are busybodies. Such people we command and urge in the Lord Jesus Christ to settle down and earn the food they eat. And as for you, brothers and sisters, never tire of doing what is good. Word of God for the people of God. Thanks. All right, and today we're really blessed to have Wendy singing God Can. Uh, so with God Can, uh, what came to mind is that basically we're not, I don't think we've even scratched the surface of what's possible with God because uh, I haven't seen anyone move mountains recently. So, <laughs> um, yeah, and one verse that comes to mind is Mark ten twenty seven, where Jesus says, with men it is impossible, but with God it is not. Uh, for with God all things are possible. So um, I feel like it's, it's worth our time and our energy to actually uh, uh, experiment and try to see what is actually possible and, and stretch our boundaries of what we, we think is possible and, and exercise what God has given us uh, to do through our faith in him. <laughs> So here's God can.
there was this pastor standing at the door. Pastors used to just stand at the door at the end of the service and everybody would walk by and say their pieces, you know. And one of the pieces that uh, was said and is said often to a pastor is, oh, nice uh, message or uh, speech or uh, sermon or homily. If you really are an educated church person, you'd say homily. That's very impressive. So if you want to say that to me after service, that's okay with me. <laughs> homily just means a short message, basically, or a sermon. But, um, but here's the thing. That one day, this pastor, who was young and counted on everybody's word as they came out the door, you know, as how well he did. He had his own kind of uh, scale going in his head, his own sort of survey going on. And, and finally, this uh, woman walks up to him after he's preached, and she says, well, pastor, um, first of all, um, you read the sermon. Uh, it was pretty bad. And uh, it's not worth reading again. And, and the pastor looks at her like, it's kind of hurtful, but okay. All right. I hear what you're saying to me. Oh, oh wait, I don't think this. It's just what everybody else is saying about you. <laughs> you know the busybodies in church? Do you know a busybody in the church? Not in this church. Never. <laughs> Never. Not a rumor is ever spread. Not a person's life is examined by others. There's no judgment ever cast on somebody else. But here was the issue that was going on in the church of Thessaloniki. It was a church that was developed when Paul went through the first time. He traveled through this area on one of his first missionary journeys. And when he established this church... He came to this realization that this was not only an important church for the future of Christianity, because it was located in the northern part of, in those days, Greece or Mesopotamia or Mesopotamia, someplace in these borders. It's still there. The church of Thessaloniki actually has been resurrected. I mean, it's been excavated and uh, hopefully someday we'll be able to travel there. In fact, Stephanie and I have been talking and praying about our next trip and it might be to the Greek islands for the purpose of going through the, the uh, path of Paul and um, to see where he did his missionary work. But this was a critical place because it's where Greek mythology was meeting Christian um, teaching. And there was a need for the church to be diligent about keeping straight the stories of Jesus and not allowing false teaching to bring people one way or another, or worse, commingling their particular sociological understanding of life with the shocking news that God actually loves and cares for and redeems all people, Gentiles, Jews, Greeks, anybody and everybody was welcome in the church. Well, this second letter that he wrote, Second Thessalonians, was to go back and say, okay, well, wait a minute, a few things that we sort of set in place and we thought would be automatic, and we thought you all knew how important this was, so the missionaries, including Paul and a couple of his others that you'd recognize, you know, Silas and there might have been John Mark there and a couple of others. But as they went through the first time, they were the missionaries. They, they did most of the work. They prepared uh, meetings for people. They, they had Bible studies. They, they baked the bread and found the wine and, and served communion. They, they were the workers. They worked day and night in order to make sure the church would have an opportunity to come together and worship. And also to be in service to those in the community who had need. Those without enough food. The widows, the orphans, those who were powerless, anybody in the culture that needed some special attention, they spent that time in the first time through. Paul writes back to say, well, wait a minute now, there's something that's kind of fallen apart here. There seems to be those amongst you who are idle. I love this little, this little cartoon. It's the idol of idleness. Now it's spelled differently, but the meaning is clear. When our idleness becomes our idol, when we think that our job is to get to a point in life where we can sit in the chair with our, that's a remote control or just a really deformed finger. I'm not sure, but, you know, and just sit there and sort of take life in and uh, not get up. I mean, do you remember the days where you actually had to get up out of your seat and walk across to something called a television and turn to one of the 13 channels? Remember that time? Or if you were really fancy, you would have a UHF you know, channel that you could go in there and sort of tune it in. 
And my job was rabbit ear number right, the right side of the rabbit ears, remember? And tinfoil flags that we'd hang up. Anyway, and then you got a real TV that sat on top of the old TV because that was, so it'd be up a little higher so you could see it, right? Well, then came remote controls and my dad, that was child number five and number six were his remote controls. Okay, so, <laughs> son, go, go take this. Well, they started to believe that the harder they worked at the beginning of their time as Christians and the development of the church became a right for them to do less. I'll give you an example. It's like a church leader who feels like they paid for their parking space for 30, 40 years. And even though their name's on, not on it, everybody knows who parks in that space every Sunday. You don't have designated parking spaces, do you? I know five of you that do, so there you go. Or the parking space that says pastor, that's right up front, closest to the building. Um, I actually had one of those in one church I served, and I said, please take that off of there. Because I'm a pretty able-bodied person. I can walk from where I park, and I would rather put a guest spot there. And so we put in guest parking. And I, you know, that's something we've talked a little bit about this in the trustees. We don't have guest parking here, but we basically have three parking lots. And everybody seems to make room for somebody else. Um, the choir might park a little closer than everybody else, but no, that's okay, because they're the choir. You know how this goes? There's ranking in the church. There's politics everywhere. But here's the thing, when they found that there were people that weren't working at all and they were receiving food that was going out of the mouths of those that needed it more than they did, they named this. In fact, uh, to paraphrase, Paul said, no soup for you. <laughs> Seinfeld, are we, are we touching base here? All right, for those of you that never watched Seinfeld, you can go look it up on a YouTube and just type in, no soup for you. It's the most quoted phrase from one of the most famous shows uh, about nothing. The whole show was about nothing. <laughs> I don't know how they filled a half an hour every week with nothing, but that was Jerry Seinfeld's job, to write scripts about nothing. And the entire show is wrapped around this. And at the very end, they all get arrested. Oh, have you seen the end? Have you seen the last show? They all end up in jail? All right, spoiler. Anyway, so that was only like 18 years ago. Here's the thing. Idleness, this idea of reaching a place of entitlement, that you don't have to put forth the effort anymore, that, it's, it's, that God is going to just let you cruise right on into the end of life. It's a myth. Retirement. You're just tired all over again. That's what it means, to be tired all over again. That's why it's retirement. Didn't you understand where the word came from? So this is the idea that you don't ever really get to say, I'm done. In life, in love, in family, you're not really ever done. Even in death itself, we continue to be an influence in our, in our lives. My dad, two days ago, is the anniversary of his death. He died 11 years ago. My dad served in World War II as a merchant marine. Um, he you know, went to be in the Marines. This is World War II Navy here, by the way. Um, but his eyesight wasn't good enough, and so he went next door to the recruiters. And as a merchant marine, he spent the war uh, in two pretty dangerous situations. He was the engine, um, he was actually in charge of the engine room. I forget his rank at that time. And his job was to take care of the one diesel engine in a, in a uh, aircraft fuel freighter. And he would run across the Pacific from California into the, the Pacific Islands. And uh, you know, his job was to maintain that engine as they went on this ship that was supposed to be escorted by uh, military other naval ships that would protect them, but most of the time they were on their own. And he said they had a little pop gun on the, the front of the boat, on the bow, and um, it was 150 millimeter cannon that they had to defend themselves as they were running this. Basically, it was a giant bomb that was crossing the Pacific. He moved on to troop transport. Uh, you remember the, during World War II, they took the Queen Mary and they painted her gray. And she was called the Gray Ghost at that time. And her job was to take 
troops over into the Pacific theater and to also into Europe. And because it was one of the fastest ships on the ocean. And so it was put into service to take these folks. Now he, he ended up on a Liberty ship. That was his last, um, his last deployment was to take troops over and then bring troops home at the end of World War II on these old Liberty ships. And, you know, again, he ended up in the engine room. That's why he lost 90% of his hearing. He, he was down there, you know, they didn't think about, you know, a lot of ear protection in those days. And in the, in the original ones, and I'm telling stories about my dad here because I, he still influences my life. I can still remember him on Saturday morning when I thought, because I stayed up late Friday night, I could sleep in on Saturday morning. That never happened in our house. He had something for me to weed, cut, or mow. And so he'd come in and stand over my bed at about 7.30 and go, James, get out of bed. I was still in bunk beds at that time, so my brother Bob was uh, top or bottom, and he'd just wake us both up. We got things to do. We got things to do. So there was no sleeping in. People used to watch cartoons on Saturday morning, and I didn't get to one of those until I was maybe 12 or 13, and and it was it was weird to not be doing something in our house all the time. Now, a perfectionist, yes, hard to get along with sometimes, yes, but my dad and I still have conversations almost every night. You know, there's some kind of element of him in my life. The same with my mom who raised six boys. She was not in the military this way, but she served in, and her family served in the USO, and they, they hosted hundreds and hundreds of sailors on the East Coast in their home and in their community, and they put on the dances, and they put on the dinners. Uh, that's where she met my dad. And, you know, the, the whole world was involved in World War II and World War I. My grandfather actually wore a uniform exactly like this, um, World War I in, in Army. Um, he served in that war as a medic. Um, it's where he learned how to do battlefield surgery and some form of plastic surgery. So I have a long history of military in my family. But I can tell you that a very intense man, uh, my grandfather. I, he died before I was born, but I remember the stories of him and everything that he did. He developed a film for fun. I mean, he, uh, he built his own farm and his own ranch in Lafayette, California. Uh, my dad built three businesses from the ground up and also worked in a corporation. The work ethic of the generation that built this country in many ways, I don't think we're duplicating this today. We've seemed to go on a way of idleness. The idolatry for the sake of taking care of ourselves and getting what we deserve and getting the kind of jobs and roles and recognition that we think we deserve. So Paul goes right at the heart of this. He says, you know, if you sit around long enough without enough to do, you start to become not busy, but a busy body. That's actually a term in the scriptures. Um, it's in there. It's not, uh, it's not something that was thrown in there as kind of an English colloquialism later. But in this church, there was those who decided if they didn't have enough going on in their life, they would engage everybody else's life. And they would track people and start rumors and talk about what was going on, which was especially exciting in a church and in a, in a region where Thessaloniki was. Because that was a way for them to sort of parse out those who were in the church. But they were actually not really Christians because they weren't really Jews. See, there was this idea that you had to go back and be Jewish before you were a Christian. And this whole argument started surfacing in the early church. The Judaizers were those who believed if you were not circumcised. Can you imagine some of these checks you'd have to get through to be a member of that church? Okay, you can, let's move on. You had to make sure that you knew some of the common laws of the Old Testament, or in those days it would be the scrolls from the Torah, the Pentateuch, the Talmud. You'd have to know some of these things. You'd have to recite them before you were allowed in. But there were people showing up, especially a lot of Greeks who would just show up because they heard that this Jesus Christ was this amazing savior who would redeem the whole world. And so there it was. There was this a relationship that was trying to be built with the church. 
I think God's work ethic is not that everybody has to do a certain amount of work. It's what you do with what you have that counts. And so this whole idea that you would not eat if you did not work or you could not work enough in order to earn this, but you had to put in whatever you could do, put your own effort in to the extent where God was being able to use your gifts. I don't think this has changed. God's work ethic is to use what you have for the Lord. No matter how little or how much it is in terms of productivity, this was not a measure of productivity. It was a measure of willingness to be using who you were for the glory of the church and the glory of God. God's work ethic. So here's basically how it breaks down. I wish I had a recliner up here with a remote to do this with, but anyway, I'll just, I just hang out with you here, okay? Do your part to benefit the whole group. And remember, we see this as Westerners who think that there was such a thing as individuality in these days, and there really wasn't. You weren't a person of value on your own. You were a person of value by where you came from and who you represented and who your family was. It was about your ancestry. And it was also about people that would come after you. And so there is a connection here of community, but you were called as an individual to serve in certain roles. And if it was the whole family that showed up, great, but it was a matter of you being held accountable for this. You would work for what you would do. You wouldn't just receive things because you happened to be in the area. It wasn't, it wasn't faith by osmosis. It wasn't showing up at the edges or the periphery. Remember, this is the early church. They're still fighting against Roman authority and occupation. There was a lot to do, and most of it had to be done in secret. Now think about this. You couldn't just put together a, a worship service in your home and then have people show up and you would read a section of a, of a letter that you got from this man named Paul. Or it would be a prayer that was passed on by Peter who was writing them from the Jerusalem Council and sending these out there. There is an actual gospel of Peter, but it's not in the canon. It's not canonized in our scriptures, but it has some very interesting prayers in there for the people. And um, you should read it sometime if you get a chance. But it's, there's, there are these sections in the Apocrypha. There are sections in other places that talk about the church and talk about what they needed to do in order to stay safe and also to take the risk of worshiping. And everybody needed to contribute. Now, if a person couldn't feed themselves or they had no abilities or they were injured or they were somehow mentally uh, slow and needed some assistance, this was not to rule out people that wanted to work but couldn't. This was really not people who could work, who didn't. No soup for you. Those who didn't engage in their own life became people who engaged in everybody else's. How destructive is this in the church to have busy bodies who just want to stir things up? You know, there are people who misery loves company. You've heard that expression? Um, I didn't really quite understand that until I got miserable once and I decided you should all be miserable with me. I was in college and then I thought, oh, that's what that means. Uh, the question I've asked several groups in the church here, and I'll ask you today. How long does it take to build a healthy, vibrant church worshiping God through Jesus Christ? How many years does it take? Five years. <laughs> a lifetime. A lifetime. Continuous. So it never stops. That's probably a good answer. A lifetime. Everybody being involved. How long does it take to tear a church apart? I've watched it. I've seen it. I've been, I've been a part of that. I was in leadership as a district superintendent when I watched churches dissolve. One church dissolved completely over a rumor of something that wasn't even true. Because of one person who felt like they weren't getting what they wanted from the church. So their goal then was to destroy the church itself. It doesn't take much in a community that depends on trust, on labor, on love, on forgiveness, on reconciliation, 
the relational part of us being together is where we continue to relate to each other on an ongoing basis. And here's, here's the, the, the kicker is that this is the way God designed it. God didn't design the body of Christ to be this autonomous, uh, self-functioning, self-feeding, and self-motivating group of people that just march forward with one doctrine, with one kind of way of looking at the world. It's not about unanimity. It's not about everybody thinking the same. It's about unity within our diversity. It's about working together all the way through and keeping that ball going. And the last, moving to the last, capable persons not carrying their own weight, that became an issue, a burden on the church and a burden on people around them. Nobody wants to be a burden. And you know, people that actually do have needs and are mm, strong enough in their own character to receive help, which is not easy for some of us. In fact, it's not easy for most of us to just receive another person's help. That's why we're terrible patients most of the time with other people, especially those we love. It's like we get after folks when they're trying to do their best because they're not sort of measuring up. Oh, I had an aunt like that. Oh, gosh. She was hard to love. But it just took more effort to do that. If I ever call you an EGR, it, I, I would let it slip out. It stands for extra grace required. <laughs> and I say it with love because... It's not, we all have our moments when we are the EGR in the room. We all have our moments, right? But it's just where we know that God has unlimited grace for us. Because really if God was looking for workers and laborers only and those who are always performing at top level and always, always perfect in their glorification of God, you know, we, we, none of us would be here. None of us would be here. We are sinners. We are broken. Work quietly. Wow. Those who work but don't need any identification or applause, they don't want that necessarily, that are working in the background. Earn your own living. Find something you're good at and work hard at that so that you can support yourself and others. There is something about this. It's not, this is the thing about Christianity that, that bother a lot of people is that Christianity is not a religion that says everybody work down to the most, the lowest common denominator of human existence. Actually, Christ asked us to make unbelievable sacrifices of love so that we would raise each other up, that we would get better together, that we would go stronger together, that the expectation would be that we would grow, mature. Paul talks about meat and milk. He's talking about those who are just starting out in Christianity and their faith walk and they, how they need milk. They need just the basic close to the heart, close to the breast, so to speak, of feeding it's where we're nurtured and we're given life as infants in the faith, but we're supposed to move from milk to meat. We're supposed to move to wean ourselves off of the basic kind of understandings of who God is. And to come into the, some of the more complicated parts and realms of theology and learning about how the church has to stand up in pretty hostile conditions, even in our own country today, this hostility against Christianity and against the church continues to kind of grow. Can you imagine hate crimes against a church? We don't seem to need to imagine what hate crimes against a temple or synagogue or mosque is. But against the church, we pray that's not going to happen. But we would need to stand as the body of Christ in the persecution that Jesus talked so much about. If you're hated because of me, then count that all good, <clears throat> brothers and sisters. The last one is never stop doing the good thing, the right thing. There are days that it's easier to give up than it is to go forward. There's, that's true for all of us. There are days that as people of faith that we kind of think it'd be a whole lot easier if I just didn't even let people know what I think or what my belief is or what my stance is on certain things.
things that God would call me to address, even though I don't want to make that public because I know I'm going to put myself under public scrutiny. But Paul is saying to these Christians, these people in this very eclectic community, don't stop doing, never get tired of doing the right thing, the right thing. Let me just pray for us. Lord, we have made our elections this past week. We know that some people feel like they won. Some people feel like they lost. Some people feel like they are, they've succeeded because they have the public support and others might have to go and find a job and do something else. But as we measure our, our status in the community and in the world, let us look first to you, O oh God. What jobs do you have for us to do? What are you calling us to do? Where do we excel in our service to you? And how can we, no matter what our age or experience, how can we apply ourselves to bring the kingdom of God on earth as it is in heaven? That's what we just are going to pray in the Lord's Prayer. Lord, we're asking for you to give us bread and strength so that we can be a part of this that's happening on earth as it is in heaven. Our Father. Our Lord and our Savior, we give you thanks in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Would you pray with me, please? Father, We've celebrated those who've served, and we're hearing the call that we need to serve. So first, I want to pray for the First United Methodist Church of Paso Robles and the First United Methodist Church of North Hollywood as they're praying and deciding where they can serve you, Lord. And I ask you to come to each one of us and help us to know where you would like us to be, Lord. How can we move forward in our church, in our community, and in your world? Help us to discern what you want for us, Lord. We are so blessed that you love us and that you meet us right where each one of us is now and where we will be. And we just remember each day to embrace you and your son Jesus. We have those recovering from illness. I pray for my brother-in-law who's got RSV, RSV and also cancer. We pray for those dealing with COVID still and those trying to recover. We pray for those in the hospital and the doctors helping them and the nurses. And we pray for those who are mourning, Lord. Be with them. Surround them. Love them. And we pray for those in cancer treatment. May they continue to recover and try different treatments as you've given us the brains to figure some of these things out, Lord. We pray for those in hospice that when it's time, they come to you. Because, Lord, you've told us that you are there and you will be there. I ask that we take a moment for silent prayer to lift those who are in our hearts to God. And sometimes when we don't know what else or how else to pray, Lord, we say your prayer. Would you join me in the Lord's Prayer, please? Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory.
forever and ever. Amen. At this time, we have a chance to think about what we've been given and how we might move those blessings forward. And also just to give thanks for all we're blessed with. for everything you've blessed us with. May you receive these offerings to go forth into your world and do your will. Amen. Please remain standing for our closing hymn. Yeah, um, so what came to mind with the, this hymn is that I realize that we live in a world um, where sadly uh, many are led by uh, the tyranny of the experts and those experts are, uh, are actually fallible, um, imperfect beings that are not omniscient yet we follow them uh, all too often. Um, and, and a verse that came to mind is Proverbs 3, 5, uh, trust in the Lord with all thine heart uh, and lean not on your own understanding nor on the experts' understandings. Uh, when we acknowledge him, uh, he shall direct all of our paths. So we should go to him first before people. <laughs> This is uh, Lead Me, Lord. today. Let's sing this together one more time. Lead me
Would you have a seat? Good morning, Julian. Good morning. How are you? I am blessed. I'm blessed. I have something I wanted to share. I have an invitation today. Oh, an invitation. It is. An invitation. You know I like a party. Uh, well, this is the new member class party. I love that. Yeah. So if you, if not only if you are not yet a member and would like to become one, but if you're curious about what membership might look like in our church now, today, post-COVID and moving into the future, I welcome you. I invite you to come. I even brought donuts. So, but they're only for the new members class. No soup can for I, you. Can yeah. I quit and join again? Yes, you can. You can be a member and come to class. We would love for that. But it's, we're going to do that right after church. So I can't stand back there and have you tell me what you thought of the sermon. So, oh, well. Uh, but yeah, so that's going on the, right after church today. And I know there's also a, a group, can't ride. There's a group that's meeting and talking about the work that we need to do for trustees. Yep. That's going to happen right after church as well. Yep. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Awesome. All right. Well, what do we got going on for the life of the church? <gasps> Friendsgiving. The thing is that this, this is coming Wednesday. Wednesday. You guys better start cooking, because I'm gonna come hungry. And niños de baja. The bags. Uh, I returned. I know some people returned bags today. Those little blue bags. But next week they're due, right? And don't forget to put the five dollars in there, because that helps with the shipping. Okay. Uh, community Christmas shop. Yes, please. Ooh. Oh, can I hold that? <laughs> my squishmallow. I like that. Okay. It looks good with me. It does. <laughs> Here you go. We're, there's been a little confusion about the bags that we're gathering, which go to the orphanage. Those are those blue bags that some of you brought this week and that are due next week. But Christmas shop is coming in December. So that takes place over at First Christian here in Newberry Park. They put out tables and toys, and they greet people as they come in, and they have shoppers that go around with them to gather toys. They have wrappers who help wrap the gifts for these families. They also have entertainment for the kids so they don't see what their parents are doing. And then they also have a group area where they can pray with the families. So it's a big community event. It's not just our church. It's throughout our community. So if you are interested, they're new toys. I don't get to buy toys anymore for my family, so I get to buy them for other people. And it can be any age group, but they are new. And if, But I just wanted to mention, if you happen to get one that needs batteries, it's a nice thing to attach the batteries to the toy as well. And these will be gathered through December, I think the first weekend in December. Where do we bring them? December 4th. We bring them here. We're going to have a big box in the back. The event is the following weekend, and I believe you can go online to sign up if you want to participate in that event, and you could talk to Barbara or, I thought I saw Janice, yeah, here. Um, they know a lot about that, but there's two different things going on, both wonderful ways to help and serve in our all community. Things. So thank you for letting me yes. clarify. Yeah, I don't get to keep them? No. Darn. Okay. All right. And then the, oh, December 4th, the Powell Family Christmas Open House and an all-church work day. You know we love that. Bring your work gloves. And Christmas Eve services at 7 p.m. and Christmas Day is at 10 a.m. Come to both. And who are the flowers from? Oh, Bob and Kathy. Oh, my goodness. How is that possible? You're not even 50 years old. You were 12. She was a child bride. And Miss Roseanne Cooley, or as my kids like to call her, Mrs. Cooley, because she was one of their teachers. <laughs> she is providing coffee fellowship and happy birthday. Who do we have happy birthday to? J little Jimmy Ford. Little Jimmy Ford, where are you? Oh, I saw you, little Jimmy Ford. Happy birthday, and Marilyn Matthews, and Ed Miyasaka. Does everybody want to sing? Yeah. St. Matthew. 
Matthews Church family, welcome home.